It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks so very much, Speaker. Thanks so very much. Speaker, my first uh, question is for the Premier. Apparently, uh, the Premier has, uh, has admitted that his low-wage policies don't even fly with him. He admitted he couldn't live on $15 an hour, yet he expects literally hundreds of thousands of Ontario workers to do just that. His low-wage policy took $5,300 out of those very workers' pocket speaker for three years. For three years, this premier kept that low-wage po low policy in place. It was one of his many, many bad ideas, Speaker. So why is he now refusing? Why is he now refusing to put that $5,300 back into the pockets of the people that he took it from? To respond, the premier. Thank you for the question through you, Mr. Speaker. During this pandemic, Ontario relied on more than ever our frontline workers, the people that were working in the factories, people working in the retail and grocery stores, checking uh, people out. But I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, they deserve the $15 an hour. And I find it ironic coming from the leader of the NDP. One day, she's okay with the $15, and bingo, the next day, it's $17. People don't know where, where the leader of the NDP stands. She flip-flops back and forth, not knowing where she stands on any single issue. It's no, 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 no to $15, no to building transit, no to building subways, no to building LTC. It's always no. Vote for the NDP, and there's a party of no. No, 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 no. That's what the NDP are all about. Supplementary question. Oh, fifteen dollars was so 2016, 2017. It should have come in in 2019, and instead, this premier stole fifty. Took fifteen hundred dollars. I'm going to ask you to withdraw. Withdraw fifty-three hundred dollars from the pockets of working people, and he's the one that cancelled the subway, or rather, a, a LRT in my own riding. So I don't know what he's talking about. But nonetheless, the low-wage policies of this government are absolutely hurting people. Everything is going up, Speaker. The cost of housing is up. The cost of electricity is up. The cost of gas is up. The cost of food is up. The cost of insurance is up. The cost of milk and butter is up, Speaker. The Premier knows his new minimum wage isn't enough for hardworking families to make ends meet. So my question is, will he do the right thing and return that $5,300 that he took out of the pockets of minimum wage workers? Premier. Mr. Speaker, there's 760,000 people that are doing cartwheels today. They ended up getting an increase. They ended up getting an increase to $15 an hour, well, well deserved. And I know what really ticks off the NDP when we are the party of the frontline workers, our workers, when we stood there with some of the top labour leaders in all of Ontario. They were going crazy, the NDP. Matter of fact, our friend Smokey Thomas from OPSU said we actually have a government that is listening and doing some things for the working people of this province. And Jerry Diaz from Unifor, one of the largest labor uh, unions in, in the entire country, this is his quote. But at any time that we can see an increase, the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which we know the majority of minimum wage workers in this province are women, it's what? a day in which we recognize that things are moving in the right direction. <laughs> Jerry Diaz from Unifor, again, we're the party of the working people. You're the party of no. Final supplementary. Speaker, what the Premier needs to acknowledge is he did take that $5,300 out of the pockets of these hardworking workers, and I can tell him hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, are at food banks today. They're not doing cartwheels. They're at food banks because of this Premier's low-wage policies and his bad choices. Everything is going up. We all know it, and in fact, the dollar isn't stretching as far as it has in the past because inflation is also uh, eroding it, Speaker. These low-wage policies hurt Everybody. It hurts the workers and it hurts the economy. It hurts the entire province. Speaker, will the premier do the right thing? Put that $5,300 back in people's pockets and give all the money back that fo that folks deserve, and actually help Ontarians to build a decent life in this province. Premier. Mr. Speaker, one of the major reasons the prices are going up is because something called the carbon tax that the NDP voted for 
I call it the big green scam instead of the big green deal. They love going after the little guy and gal. They love putting pressure on people that have to drive from point A to point B to drop their kids off to go to work. They want to increase taxes. They voted no to lowering taxes. They, they voted yes to the carbon tax, 10 cents a litre. So every time you pump that, that gas in your car, just take a look at the leader of the NDP and know it's 10 cents more. And it's going to continue going up. That is the cost when, when the NDP vote no to absolutely everything that you have. Is there one thing that you stand for? They'll stand for one thing one day, the next day, Response. bang, it changes. On their website, it was $15 two days ago. Now, all of a sudden, it's $17. They got to make up their mind. And I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. Maybe he will take this one seriously. Yesterday, the member for St. Catharines asked a straightforward question, a very straightforward question to get justice for veterans with disabilities, but the Premier, this Premier Ford, had no answers for her. Canadian Legion, the Canadian Legion has asked the government to solve an unfair policy that literally results in injured veterans becoming homeless because the Premier is clawing back money from their pockets. Veterans have served this country with valour and with honour. If they receive a disability award from uh, Veterans Affairs, Affairs Canada, Premier Ford claws it back, and he shouldn't be doing that. So my question is, will he me immediately un end rather this unfair uh, clawback of benefits that our veterans uh, with disabilities rightfully should be getting? To apply, member for Ottawa West Nepean, and Park. Thank you so much, Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak about the commitment that our government has for veterans. And that commitment was on firm display yesterday when our government introduced legislation to ensure that nobody can be denied the right to wear the poppy, because our government. Our government believes that it is so crucial for us to demonstrate our firm support to our veterans. And that's why, Speaker, our government took action last year to expand the mandate of the Soldiers' Aid Commission, a program that is here in Ontario, a unique program across the Confederation that demonstrates Ontario's commitment to supporting veterans. And prior to last year, Speaker, there were many servicemen and women that couldn't access these vital supports. And our government took action to change that. We Spons? expanded the Soldiers' Aid Commission so that every man and woman who has served this country valiantly could access those supports that the government of Ontario provides. We're going to keep being there for veterans going forward. Thank you very much. <laughs> the supplementary question. Well, uh, Speaker, thanks. Um, the Legion Ontario Command uh, penned a letter to Minister Tobolo. I'll actually send it by this page, uh, Fraser, over to the Premier in case he hasn't seen it. Uh, and in that letter, President Gary Pond said, and I quote, we have numerous veterans who are fearful of even applying for compensation, knowing the Ontario provincial government will claw back their basic needs and shelter until that disability award is spent. The Legion says some veterans have literally ended up homeless after they unknowingly had their shelter allowance clawed back by this Premier. So it has to stop. This absolutely must stop. Why hasn't the Premier done the right thing and stopped clawing back the disability award from our country's proud veterans? Again, to reply, member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. And I'm pleased to speak a little bit further to our government's reforms to the Soldiers' Aid Commission. Along with expanding the Soldiers' Aid Commission supports to all service men and women, our government also understood that this program had been underfunded by previous governments. And so we took action, and I'm pleased to say that we supported the expanded mandate and expanded the Commission's funding by about 600 per cent to 1.55 million dollars per year. Speaker, the Soldiers' Aid Commission provides financial assistance for veterans and their families of up to $2,000 over a 12-month period per household, and this can go to cover a number of different items, including health-related items like hearing aids, glasses, prescription, dental needs, home-related items like home repairs, specialized equipment like assistive devices, wheelchairs and prosthetics, personal items, what? and for the first time in Ontario's history, 
industry employment-related supports. So this program is here for veterans. We're expanding its mandate and we're increasing its funding because our government. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the final supplementary. Speaker, the Legion Ontario Command of Provincial President Gary Pond has asked the Premier to stop this cruel and disrespectful policy. And I agree with him. New Democrats agree. It has to stop. Veterans should be able to afford the basics like food and shelter, not get their shelter and food allowances clawed back by this Ford government. Life is un unaffordable under this Premier. We've already established that, Speaker. We simply must ensure that veterans don't become homeless because of their Ontario government's policies of clawing back their benefits. It should have been included, Speaker. I don't disagree with the member that a great bill was passed yesterday. We supported it. This clawback ending should have been included in that bill that this House passed yesterday. That's what should have happened. But now the member for St. Catharines has put a motion on the table. We need to do the right thing. We need to get this done and get this done now. Will Question. this government pass that motion and commit to clawing back or to ending that clawback of benefits immediately? Give the veterans the respect that they deserve. To reply on behalf of the government, Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to tell the House and let all uh, the MPPs know that because of the leadership of Premier Ford, uh, we announced uh, a partnership with a great organization uh, called Helmets to Hard Hats, where we are working with the largest uh, skilled trades unions uh, in Ontario to help veterans when they come back from uh, serving Canadians uh, overseas to uh, get mental health supports, to get housing supports, to get full training. Uh, and and shelter uh, and food to get into uh, these meaningful careers uh, in the skilled trades. Mr. Speaker, because Order. of the leadership of Premier Ford and our government, we've partnered to the tune of millions of dollars with helmets to hard hats. And I'm proud to say that a thousand veterans Spons? are now on a, a pathway into a skilled trades job making six figures with pensions and benefits. That's how we're making a difference. I'm going to ask the official opposition to come to order. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, yesterday, the Minister of Transportation dodged qu questions about her visit to the Silver Lakes Country Club in March. The visit occurred just one month before the Bradford Bypass route was altered. We now know the family member from Willowdale's, we, the member from Willowdale's family co-owns this property. Uh, the province's proposed route originally sliced through the second, third, and eleventh holes of the golf course. After this visit, the ministry revised this plan, one that avoids the golf course and instead runs through residential properties. No rationale for the change was provided. If the minister has nothing to hide, then she should be able to answer this basic question. Uh, and, does the, and I want the premier to answer this question. Uh, does he really expect Ontarians to believe that while the minister and the member from Willowdale toured the golf property, the bypass project was never question. discussed? It never came up. Will you tell the people of this province what happened at that golf course? Again, I'll ask members to make their comments through the chair. The Premier. We're, we're a party that builds infrastructure, that builds highways, builds transit. By, by building the Bradford Bypass, we're Order. saving commuters one way, 35 minutes, two ways, over an hour, that they can spend time with their family, Mr. Speaker. Everyone in the region wants it. The only person and people that don't want it are the folks on the other aisle. People from York Region, Simcoe County, Bradford, West uh, Gwillimbury, and East Gwillimbury. Not only that, the most important people are the Holland Marsh Growers Association. Those are the people it matters to because those are our hard-working farmers. The hard-working farmers that know they want to get their goods to market as soon as possible, they don't want to be stuck in gridlock. If it was up to the NDP and Liberals, they had 15 years to build this uh, bypass, they didn't do it. They didn't do it because Response. they do not believe in infrastructure. They, they don't even uh, believe in, in a, in a uh, uh, cart and buggy uh, going down the roads. They are against absolutely everything. They're a party of no, no, no. Thank you. The next the supplementary question. 
issue here is ethics and it's transparency, and I understand that this Premier doesn't get that. At the time of their meeting at Silver Lakes, the member for Willowdale had not yet been promoted to Cabinet, and as the Toronto Star revealed on Sunday, he only declared a conflict of interest when he was promoted in June, two months after the bypass route was changed, three months after his meeting with the minister on the golf course. The bypass and Highway 413 are already very problematic. The City of Barrie has requested a new environmental assessment, for instance. Speaker, no one in Ontario believes the story that the minister just happened to show up at the precise location of the new Bradford bypass on this golf course. Why won't the government release the data about, the, wh about why the route was changed? If you have a case for it, make it and share it with the people of this province who are going to pay for the bypass and the highway just to save 30 seconds of their transport. Once again, I'll ask the members to make their comments to the chair. Minister of Transportation to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to tell the, mem the, the opposition member is that this is a, this, the issue for the Ontarians are traffic. It's important for the people of the York region and for the, the Simcoe County and Waterloo. Because in this House in 2019, the Waterloo member said that the Ford government has to commit to a concrete plan and finish the, the Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph. So it's clear when it comes to highway constructions in her writing, she's in favor. But when it comes to the rest of the province, she's against it. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Honourable Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. For too long in Ontario, underground operators have put workers at risk and disadvantaged those that follow the rules. Under our government, we have closed a loophole that the Liberals knew about for years. They had a majority government for a while and then were supported by the NDP, but no action was taken to protect workers from these bad apples. Speaker, workers and advocates agree that there is more to be done to eliminate underground temporary help agency operators. So will the minister please explain what his plan is to increase workplace health and safety for vul vulnerable workers in Ontario? Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the honourable member from Eglinton Lawrence for her leadership uh, on this issue. Uh, Speaker, I know that the member and I share uh, the same goal as everyone else here uh, in this chamber. We want to make sure every worker in Ontario comes home safe after a hard day's work. And that begins with ending the exploitation of workers. I'm pleased to say we recently announced the most comprehensive plan in the country to protect vulnerable workers and honest employers. Our plan, if passed, would require uh, agencies and recruiters to get a license, pay a security bond, and be listed on a public online database. This will send a clear signal that we will spare no expense to protect the health and safety uh, of every single worker uh, in the province, regardless of their passport status. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to the supplementary. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. I've heard firsthand from the hard-working residents of my riding of Eglinton Lawrence about the need to support strong actions, and our government needs to take strong actions to protect these vulnerable workers. As a government, I think we need to be decisive to stop these bad apples from flourishing while breaking the law. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister, what actions will our government take if a business does not properly register or if a business tries to use a non-registered temporary help agency? Great Thank the, uh, the member again for that a very uh, important question. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, I can assure um, all of uh, her constituents and the people of Ontario that we are taking decisive action to help vulnerable workers uh, under the leadership of uh, Premier Ford uh, in our government. Speaker, these workers are mostly uh, young people, uh, women and newcomers who are being exploited by unscrupulous uh, agencies. Speaker, those who fail to get a license or choose to use an unlicensed agency will face the highest fines in the country and possible jail time. We're shining a light on lawbreakers and sending a clear message breaking the law 
is not a cost of doing business here in Ontario. If you're not following the rules, we can and we will shut you down. Again, Mr. Speaker, everything that uh, we're doing under the leadership of Premier Ford is ensuring that uh, workers have more take-home pay, that we protect workers and create more opportunities for every worker in this province. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Spe Speaker. My question is for the Premier. There's been a lot of conversation about the $1.5 billion four to six lane Bradford Bypass Highway that the Premier is rushing through the Green Belt to reward his developer buddies. However, Speaker, that highway wasn't even a topic for debate when the House rose last June. Three years ago, in 2018, the Premier did promise the good people of Sudbury that he'd complete the four laning Highway 69. However, three years later, the same 68 kilometres is still untendered. That's the same 68 kilometres was untendered when the Liberal leader, Stephen DeLuca, who was the Transporta Transportation Minister. Surely to goodness, if the Premier can snap his fingers to push through the Bradford Bypass for his buddies, he can keep his promise to Sudbury and finish the four-laning of Highway 69. Speaker, Order. will the Premier commit to tendering the final 68 kilometres of Highway 69, and when will he finally get this done? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's hard to know uh, where the opposition stands, as the Premier has said repeatedly today. Are they for highways or are they against highways? Mr. Speaker, we are working very hard on behalf of people across Ontario to expand our highway system in the south and in the north. And I want to assure the member opposite that we're working to widen Highway 69 between Perry Sound and Sudbury to four lanes to improve the safety and the operations of that highway. The widening of a 14-kilometer stretch of Highway 69 south of Alban and the realignment of the Canadian National Rail Line at Highway 522, it is still ongoing. This is a $200 million investment, Mr. Speaker, in Highway 69. And so, Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to do the important work on behalf of all Ontarians, but in particular people in the north. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, Sudbury's tired of broken promises. In 2003, the Liberals promised to complete the four laning of Highway 69 by 2007. During the 2007 election, they promised they'd complete it by 2013. Then, during the 2011 election, the Liberals promised they'd complete Highway 69 by 2018. Then, during the 2018 election, the Conservative Party promised they'd finally complete with the Liberal Party and their Transportation Minister, Stephen DeLuca, failed to get done, complete the four-laning of Highway 69. The good people of Sudbury have been incredibly patient, Speaker. However, it's now 2021. Wow. When it comes to broken promises, it's been Liberal Tory, same old story for nearly two decades. Speaker, my question is, will the Premier finally keep his promise to the people of Sudbury and tender the last 68 kilometers needed to complete the four laning of Highway 69. Minister of Transportation. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et je... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank the opposition member for listing the broken promises made by the Liberal government. The list is very long, and this is why our government is committed to do the job for the people of Ontario the work that is necessary in the north and in the south. For the 68 kilometers remaining for Highway 69, our, minister, our ministry is working hard on this. We have a lot of work to do, and we need to acquire a few properties for this. Our government is committed to expand our highway system across the province, and the previous government was not able to do that. Next question, the member for Scarborough, Goldwood. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. We've watched this government continue to flip-flop, but now you're starting to do some of the right things. You have reversed your position Order. on electric vehicles. You have finally agreed to the minimum wage. You're actually adopting some very important Liberal policies. Some might say it's never too late to do the right Order. thing. The same is true when it comes to providing Ontarians with affordable childcare. A $1 invested in childcare will get a, a $1.50 to $2 return. It will increase labour force participation, especially amongst women, increase the GDP, and ultimately revenues to the province. But more importantly, it's the right thing to do. Speaker, my question to this Premier. Tomorrow, this chamber will hear his fall economic Question. statement, and it's not too late to include affordable childcare 
Will the Premier announce tomorrow that he is signing the, the federal agreement on the $10 a day childcare? To respond, the Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. The government is going to continue to invest in affordable child care, really cleaning up the mess under the former Liberal government, where child care rose by 40 per cent for working parents. I mean, that's just absolutely unacceptable by any measurement, and yet the member opposite champions the legacy of neglect when it comes to building schools, when it comes to child care affordability. I mean, this Premier, in his first budget, allocated $2 billion every single year to build new child care spaces, 30,000 spaces, a $1 billion of capital investment, a tax credit to make life more affordable for working parents. But we do agree there's a role for the federal government to step up their investment. They currently pay 2.5 per cent of Ontario's share of child care. We think they could do much more. But but unlike the provincial Liberals who would have caved to the federal Liberal government on a child care deal, this Premier is standing strong for the best possible deal, a sustainable, long-term agreement that ensures child care is affordable for families Response. now and well into the future. The supplementary question. Speaker, back to the Premier. Women and families in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood are facing tough choices as they struggle to find childcare and to keep and hold on to their jobs. Participation rates among women in the core age group is falling in this province. Speaker, the YMCA across uh, our province and our country have written to the Premier calling for concrete steps to tackle the she session and to promote a she recovery. The letter that they sent to the Premier quotes, this economic crisis requires transformative intervention, tax for task forces and tax credits are not enough. If the Premier wants to do the right thing for women in this province, then it is time for him to join the seven other provinces and one territory and sign on to the federal government's $10 a day childcare in Ontario so families can feel that relief. I've been working with the East Scarborough Girls, and Girls Club in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood to find solutions of closing this gap. Speaker, women in Scarborough cannot fight this inequity and the sea session alone. They need their help from their government. Will this Premier sign this agreement today and stop delaying? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question again. She noted that other provinces have signed deals. Overwhelmingly, all of those provinces, the vast majority, do not have a full-day kindergarten program providing full-time subsidized care for four- and five-year-olds. So for the $3.6 billion of investment that the provincial Liberals Order. are receiving Del Duca would have left on the table our government, our Premier, and this Progressive Conservative Party saying to the federal government, we want a better deal that actually acknowledges the unique investments this province makes when it comes to quality child care. We want a long-term deal, not a five-year commitment that then ends with a massive spike in costs for the parents we all represent. We want a sustainable program, a long-term investment, and more investment from the feds who are shortchanging the people of this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children, Community and Social Services. Our veterans have made a tremendous sacrifice to make Canada and province what it is today. As we go back to the cenotaphs and legions and our ridings, we all see what a veteran looks like has changed. World War II veterans are mostly in their 90s, and Korean War vets are mostly in their 80s. And now, Speaker, most veterans you see on the 11th are from peacekeeping missions in Afghanistan. I know that I speak for all members when I say we're grateful, absolutely grateful, to all veterans for their service. So, Speaker, my question is, after veterans have done so much for us, what is this government doing to support our veterans, to show that our province is thankful for their service? Member for Ottawa West Nepean to respond on behalf of the government. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Whitby uh, for this question. And I want to start, Speaker, by really commending the member for Whitby. Uh, all of us here know that he has been a tremendously fierce advocate for veterans throughout his career in public service. And, uh, and we thank him for his continued advocacy. You know, our veterans have put so much on the line to ensure that our country and our province are free and secure. That's why our government passed a new law last year to expand the Soldiers Aid Commission's program to include all Ontario veterans and their families, regardless of when and where they served. 
Previously, the mandate extended only to veterans of the Korean War and before. This was the first meaningful change in their mandate after years of neglect by the previous government, which saw the Commission's financial assistance constrained to a very limited group of former servicemen and women. I'm pleased to add that to support the expanded mandate, the Commission's funding has been increased by about 600 per cent to $1.5 million each year, resulting in up to $2,000 a year per household. And I'm pleased to speak further in That's the supplementary. Lovely. Supplementary question? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for his answer and for explaining the government's action in supporting our veterans. This increase in funding is so well-deserved and needed for Ontario's veterans. And, Speaker, expanding the Commission's mandate to younger veterans who fought for our country is so long overdue. Connecting veterans to financial assistance is a clear way we can show that we will never forget their sacrifice, Speaker. Never forget. Can the minister tell us what the increased support through the Soldiers Aid Commission's program will look like for Ontario's veterans? Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the member from Whitby uh, for that supplemental question. The Soldiers' Aid Commission program provides financial assistance for veterans and their families of up to $2,000 over a 12-month period per household for health-related items like hearing aids, glasses, prescription and dental needs, home-related items like repairs, moving costs, furniture, replacement repair of roof and furnace, specialized equipment like assistive devices, wheelchairs and prosthetics, personal items, and employment-related supports for the first time in Ontario history. Knowing the importance of this work, our government expanded the Soldiers' Aid Commission's mandate to apply to all Ontario's veterans. While we will never forget the bravery and sacrifice of veterans of our two world wars and of Korea, it is time that we honour a new generation of servicemen and women. Our government is uh, committed to continuing to support our veterans and uh, look forward to continuing to do that moving well forward. Done. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, Member Fiki Wetnall. Uh, speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. We may not think of um, Ajax as treaty territory, but it is. Without treaties, there would be no Ontario, no Canada. The Carruthers uh, Creek headwaters forms a vital uh, ecosystem that supports Ajax with clean air and water and provides uh, flood protection in a time of increased flood risk due to climate change. Jeff Forbes, counselor for Mississauga's Scugog Island First Nation, said, has said, it's important to protect the headwaters. What changes now will have a devastating consequences for our future generations. What is Ontario doing to ensure this area is protected for future generations? And to reply on behalf of the government, the member for Barry Innisfil and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and I, I thank that member for uh, for raising that issue, and uh, I appreciate his advocacy every every step of the way when he does bring up these issues. And uh, with with all due respect to that member, uh, he knows that we in the province of Ontario we do constantly collaborate with our federal counterparts uh, when it comes to supporting resolutions and long-term solutions for drinking water, especially drinking water advisories, and support long, sustainable uh, solutions for these communities um, across Ontario, so we can build that infrastructure. In terms of Ontario and the Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, um, we've been working with and through the Indigenous Drinking Water Projects Office, and we've worked with the Ontario Clean Water Agency and the Water Curtain Clean uh, Water Centre to provide First Nation communities with access to provincial expertise in the design, construction, operation and maintenance of drinking water systems. I also Response. met with uh, Water First, who's doing a lot of great work throughout this province with support of this government. Thank you. Supplementary question. Miigwech, uh, the duty to consult Indigenous peoples on Crown conduct that may affect them is essential in protecting Aboriginal 
treaty and uh, treaty rights. This is uh, recognized and affirmed by the Constitution. The Mississaugas of Skugwag Island First Nation have stated that there is a need for consul consultation here. They want a balanced approach that respects Indigenous peoples and the lands as well as the environment. Without proper consultation, we ignore the legal and the democratic process, and we destroy what little undeveloped land is left in, the, in this area, leaving none for future generations. Will Ontario, Ontario uh, honour its treaty to con duty, to, duty to consult and listen to the Indigenous people who are trying to protect the headwaters? The member reply, the member for Barry and uh, thank you, Speaker, and I will, I'll reiterate the government, our government's commitment uh, to working and partnering with First Nation communities to resolve uh, any issues regarding water quality, drinking water on reserves, and calling on the federal government to fully take responsibility when it comes to safe drinking water. Um, and we've been, as I mentioned earlier, uh, working with our First Nation partners and other agencies, like, for example, the Ontario Clean Water Agency, that has worked over the past 10 years with many First Nations communities. Uh, for instance, uh, we have uh, the uh, we have the uh, Chippewa of Nashwash who've been on this committee and who've been helping Dorcas First Nation, Curve Lake First Nation, Henvey Inlet First Nation, Long Lake, Anishinaabe uh, First Nation, Algonquin of uh, a Golden Lake First Nation. Um, I could go on, Speaker. We also have uh, others who served and we've consulted with in terms of the clean water agencies as well, uh, and many First Nations, for example, uh, Big Grassy, Brunswick House, Cape Crocker, and, and many more. Thank you. The next question, a member for York Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Two weeks ago, I asked the Minister if she will dispel the false and hateful proposition that the unvaccinated put any lives at risk. The Minister said that, in fact, the unvaccinated do put lives at risk. Now, I submit that such statement may lead to detestation of an unidentifiable group of people and should be avoided in this House. Speaker, the daily new case numbers are now approaching 50-50. But now we learn that by memo of August 31st, the Chief Medical Officer told Ontario's medical officers and the Assistant Deputy Minister that the vaccinated have similar levels of infection as the, the, as the unvaccinated and recommended additional measures. I note that the memo predates Ontario's announcement of vaccine passports, which means they aren't based in science. So I'll ask the minister again, will she concede that the vaccinated transmit just as easily as the unvaccinated, and will she apologize for the discrimination promoted by this government? To reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and there's a, a lot there to, uh, to deal with, but what I would say is the Chief Medical Officer of Health and our government has always said from the beginning, as soon as the vaccination became available, that the best way to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your communities is to be vaccinated. Absolutely. And the numbers are showing that that's the case. We had high levels during wave three, but as more and more Ontarians are vaccinated, we're finding that the numbers are dropping. Currently today, we have 88.2% of all Ontarians aged 12 years and older having received a first dose of the vaccine and 84.6% having received the second dose. That's one of the highest rates in the world. And in addition to that, the numbers in ICU today are 137, which are 112 from Ontario and 25 people from Saskatchewan who Ontario Spons. is helping out because they're going through a very difficult time. So the facts state the case. What is happening is more and more people are being vaccinated. Our numbers are going down and the numbers in our ICU are going down as well. That Thank you. And the supplementary? fails to make the distinction. Yes, the vaccine is good at protecting oneself, but it doesn't mean that a person who's unvaccinated is putting anyone else at risk. That's what, more so than a vaccinated person, that's what the August 31st memo from the Chief Medical Officer states, in which he proposes additional measures against those that are vaccinated. But, Speaker, for 20 months, the government denied science by refusing to acknowledge natural immunity. This is the... This is despite giving government members a pass from vaccination if they can show antibodies by memo of August 18. And while the government insisted that the earth is flat, thousands of Ontarians lost their jobs and thousands are about to lose their job despite having COVID 
or having COVID antibodies. Well, finally, last Thursday, the chief medical officer stopped denying science and admitted that one can build immunity to the virus through natural exposure. My question to the Minister of Health, will she acknowledge the existence of natural immunity on behalf of the government? And why should Ontarians who had COVID or have antibodies question. to COVID lose their job because of their medical choice? Minister of Health making decisions based on science and clinical evidence since the beginning of this pandemic. And Dr. Moore has also indicated that this pandemic is now a pandemic of the unvaccinated. It is absolutely essential for people to receive the vaccination. Sure, if someone has had COVID, there are some antibodies, but they're not sufficient to protect that person and to protect others. Vaccination is the key, as well as the other public health and, and precautionary measures that we've been taking, including ventilation, social distancing, masking, and all of those other um, mechanisms. But essentially, this comes down to the need for as many people as possible to be vaccinated. And I urge everyone in Ontario who has not yet been vaccinated, please do so. It will save your life and it will protect your loved ones and it will protect your community. Next question, the member for Mississauga, Erin May. Mr. Speaker, some jurisdictions have committed to providing digital solutions and offer government services available online. When it comes to Ontario repetition, there is no question how important it is that we continue to lead the world when it comes to health care protecting workers and building infrastructure. It is now more important than ever to make sure we are leader in digital government. So Speaker, to the first ever Associate Minister of Digital Government, how do you plan to ensure that Ontario lights the path for future generations to come? Respond. The Associate Minister for Digital Government. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member of Mississauga, Aaron Mills, uh, for the question and his great work uh, in his, uh, constitu with his constituents. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to be a digital leader in Canada and, and the world. Uh, for example, we have shown that we are up to the task with the successful rollout of the Verify Ontario app for businesses. Uh, the app has been downloaded more than 1.3 million times and seen over 3.2 million scans of the official QR code. And not only that, Mr. Speaker, but over 7 million Ontarians have already downloaded the QR code. And by offering the app code on open source, we have given other jurisdictions the opportunity to model their own technology after the great work completed by the Ontario Digital Services. And we are just getting started, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Great Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for the answer. It is great to hear that our government had such a successful rollout of the Verify Ontario app for businesses and vaccine certificate with official QR code. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Ontarians called on our government for solutions. My constituents and all Ontarians need innovations through digital government that work for the people and businesses of Ontario. So, Speaker, what is the government and the minister doing to lay the groundwork to build a digital Ontario? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. The member is correct. Our government has a plan to make sure that Ontario is a digital leader. One way to achieve this ambitious goal is through the Digital ID Project. In September, we published the technology roadmap for Ontario's digital ID program, a game changer, Mr. Speaker, for the province's economy. Soon, Ontarians will be able to prove their ID safely and conveniently when required. Privacy and security are of the utmost importance, Speaker. Ontarians will have their IDs on a secure platform and they will control what information they share and when. Digital ID, Speaker, will help Fun. us combat ID fraud while protecting privacy, and it will make Ontario one of the most digitally advanced jurisdictions. Here, here. Thank you. Here, here. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is for the President, for the Minister of Health. CEO Bloor Rehab announced their vaccine mandate policy. Their policies are in line with the recommendations from the Ontario Medical Association, from registered nurses' associations, from the science table. By comparison, the government announced this Monday, November 1st, that it had received the information it had requested to make a decision on vaccine mandates for healthcare workers in Ontario's hospital. How much longer will the good people of Ontario have to wait to get clear directions from this government? Is this government ready to take its responsibility to mandate vaccination, or will you continue to lead from behind? Minister of Health. Thank you, and I thank the member very much for the question. This is something that has been under discussion for a period of time. It's not a simple situation, as the member will also know. Some hospitals have already made their own decisions with respect to mandatory vaccination, principally children's hospitals, because of the fact that children aged 5 to 11 not, cannot be vaccinated as yet. However, it is also an issue of health human resources. We know that our health human resources have been through a very difficult time caring for COVID patients over the last 20 months, and so we need to determine with the response from the letter that the Premier sent out how many people will be left, uh, will not be able to continue to work if we do bring forward a mandatory vaccination policy. It's really important, looking at other jurisdictions, looking at what's happened in, uh, in British Columbia where they've had to cancel response. some of the surgeries that have been postponed because of COVID because they don't have enough health human resources. So that is what we are taking into consideration as a final decision is close to being made. Supplementary. To be clear, Speaker, we all want this pandemic to be over. The sooner, the better. The level of stress and anxiety in our communities are through the roof. We need relief. We need relief now. But right now, what we have in Ontario is 142 hospitals making their own policies. Why, Speaker? Because the government is more worried about public opinion than patient safety, than putting an end to this pandemic. That's pretty sad. 142 different policy brings confusion, it brings conflict. The science table is clear. It said, and I quote, requiring that hospital worker be vaccinated is an evidence-based policy that protects Ontarians, end of quote. But this government refuses to listen to science, refuses to take its responsibility, refuses to lead this province. Speaker, our frontline heroes are anxious, they are tired. When is this government going to step up and Question. be a leader on vaccine mandates in our hospitals? Minister Paul. What our government has been concerned about since the beginning of this pandemic is the health and well-being of all Ontarians, right. all Ontarians that come in whether they're in home and community care, whether they're in long-term care, whether they're in hospitals. And that is why this is not an easy issue to determine, because we need to make sure that should a mandatory vaccine policy be brought in, that we would still have sufficient health human resources to care for all of the people who are in hospital with COVID and for other issues, and to be able to deal with all of the patients who've been waiting for a very long period of time to have hip or knee replacements or cataract surgeries, all of the other things that we need to catch up on. So we need to make sure that we take the needs of all Ontarians into consideration, and that's what we are doing in making this determination. Thank you. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, this government came to power in 2018 like a wrecking ball, and his backbench cheered and as they stripped away protections for workers. As, as the Premier stripped away the $15 minimum wage, his fellow Conservatives cheered him on. They cheered as Ontario's hardworking families were losing out on money that would have helped them survive. They cheered him on as the Premier stripped away paid sick days. They cheered him on as the Premier stripped away equal pay for equal work. After, th after three years of cheering on the attack on workers, why should anyone believe that the government's recent attempts to rewrite history and win votes is anything but that? And to apply the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I was proud to stand uh, with Premier Ford yesterday, uh, Finance Minister, uh, 
uh, Beth and Falvey, uh, as well as uh, two of the largest uh, labour leaders uh, in this province, representing hundreds of thousands of workers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, everything we're doing is about ensuring that workers have more take-home pay and bigger paychecks. We are. Uh, we've introduced in our Working for Workers uh, legislation, Mr. Speaker, historic workplace reforms to better protect those women and men who are going to work uh, every single day. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, is spending hundreds of millions of dollars in upskilling and retraining and training workers for better paychecks, Mr. Speaker. We will always have the backs of every single worker in this province. I hope the opposition says yes to our Working for Workers legislation. And the supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplemental is also for the Premier. The Premier's callous attack on workers has cost them $6,700 in the minimum wage change alone, Mr. Speaker. With the stroke of a pen, with the stroke of a pen, $6,700 taken away from some of Ontario's hardest workers. $6,700 may not be a lot to the Premier and his buddies, but it's a lot to the hard-working mom who was working two jobs just trying to keep a roof over their family's head and food on the table, Mr. Speaker. Now, a few months ago, the Premier said that he now appreciates the member for Don Wally West as he's walked a mile in her shoes. He's walked so far in her shoes, Mr. Speaker, that he's adopting her minimum wage plan, albeit three years too late. So now that he's walked a mile in the former Premier's shoes, what other Liberal policies is he planning to announce before next year's election, and how can we help? Mr. Labour. Well, again, uh, Mr. Up, right? Speaker, thanks to the leadership of Premier Ford and our government, 760,000 workers in Ontario are getting a pay increase on January the 1st. But, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about what happened under uh, the former Liberal government, that that member is a part of that caucus. You raised hydro bills. You tripled hydro bills in this province. Mr. Speaker, through you to the members opposite. Order. They fired 300,000 people in manufacturing, Mr. Speaker. These were great paying jobs. They increase uh, taxes, Mr. Speaker, on every individual uh, in this province Order. through their health tax, Mr. Speaker. We could go on and on and on. Order. They destroyed the lives of many workers in this province, Mr. Speaker, but I'm proud of the leadership of Premier Ford, proud to be on but. his team. We'll continue working for workers every day to ensure they have bigger paychecks. Uh, better jobs and more opportunities in every community. Hey. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. It has been months since the Ontario optometrists have heard from the Minister, although she has no doubt received hundreds of messages from patients and professionals. And just in case she's missed some, I'm going to send some over uh, with the pages. I've had constituents call my office demanding answers of when their children will be able to get an eye exam as their kids are struggling in the schools. There are seniors who can't leave their homes because they can't get an eye exam that is required for the 80-plus driver's test. Speaker, it's not fair that people's lives are being negatively impacted by this government's inaction. When will the government reach out to Ontario optometrists about getting back to the negotiating table so that children and seniors can get the eye care that they need? Minister Powell. Thank you very much, Speaker. And while well, there's one thing that I can agree with uh, the member on with respect to her question, and that is it is very disappointing that the, um, uh, the Ontario Association of Optometrists has decided to withdraw publicly provided services for children and seniors. That is done at their urging. The government continues to fund these OHIP covered services for children and seniors. However, this is a decision that's been made by the Ontario Association of Optometrists. We have made a payments to them already. We've already made a $39 million payment into their accounts to indicate that we want to work with them. We want for them to come back to the table. This is to cover some of the losses they've had in the last 10 years since their agreement expired in 2011. Nothing was done about it by the previous government, but we want to sit down with the Ontario Response. Association of Optometrists and find a result to this issue that's been going on for some years. Ontarians need eye exams, and they need them now. There is no legal mandate for the government to negotiate with the optometrists, so it's not surprising that the government has used this to their advantage to ignore the optometrists' demands. The government's proposal of a one-time catch-up payment would only be 
3.48% increase, which would only cover approximately $48 of the $75 exam. This would leave Ontario behind every province in the country. Just to catch up to the lowest funded province next, which is Manitoba, there would need to be a 65% increase to funding in Ontario. So, will the government commit to negotiating with optometrists in good faith, or are they just going to leave optometrists and their patients in a state of limbo forever? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, first, I think it's important to correct some of the misconceptions contained in this statement made by the member. First is the comparisons have been made with respect to comparisons with other provinces. That is not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. In fact, the payments in Manitoba are made every other year, not every year. Secondly, we have already to withdraw the unparliamentary remark and conclude her answer. Speaker. Um, in addition, we have already indicated that we want to sit down, go back to mediation with the Ontario Association of Optometrists. We've already offered a payment with respect to past payments that uh, they have not received since 2011. We want to continue with an 8.48% increase at this point now, retroactive actually to April 1st, and we want to discuss the overhead issues they've, they've told us and told many Spons? of you are really important to them. We are prepared to sit down at mediation and continue these discussions with the association, but they are not willing to come back. So that you can't negotiate by yourself. We ask Thank you. <laughs> Next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Last year, this minister and this premier subjected Ontario's kids to the longest school shutdown in the world. Ontario's kids are in crisis. They've regressed, and many are depressed. Yet the minister pats himself on the back despite plexiglass and cohorts. The no talking during lunch, boxes at recess drawn on asphalt, and the occasional physical distancing stick. And to add to that, the hybrid learning system where the teacher splits their attention between the students on the screen and students in class, and a modified semester system that subjects students to two and a half hours of lecture for shame. Speaker, on Tuesday, the Ontario Public School Board Association wrote to the Minister of Education and asked to put an end to modified semesters. Will the minister listen to students, listen to parents, and listen to the school boards and put an end to the disaster that is the modified semester? To reply, Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, um, you know, our government followed the best medical expertise of not just the Ontario Science Table, the Chief Medical Officer felt, but of sick kids in CHEO. I think the member opposite would agree are credible, reputable, global pediatric hospitals, all of whom have supported the actions, the layered approach we've taken. Now, with that said, we agree we need to ensure we incrementally and consistently move to more normal learning experience for children. It's why this September kids were permitted under the provincial guidance to participate in sports and extracurriculars and clubs, things that are important to the development of a child. I agree we need to continue to move towards a more normal learning experience so long as it is safe. We're working with the Chief Medical Officer of Health to understand when and if we can make uh, further adaptations to the learning experience, for, especially for our high school kids, realizing that the quadmaster system, while it ensures uh, cohorting of children, we appreciate it's a long period of time for a child to learn. We're working with the CMOH to uh, pivot back to a more normal learning experience when it is safe, knowing that we've increased mental health funding as well for children right across Ontario, four times out of the former Liberal government. Supplementary. Speaker, the minister and the government aren't listening. The boards are asking to put an end to the modified semester system, which is wreaking havoc on Ontario's children. Speaker, the greatest victims of the government's pandemic response are children, children who are statistically at almost zero risk of a severe outcome from COVID, children who are made to suffer most in the flat-out theater of the absurd created by this government. This government closed schools longer than anywhere on the planet, despite seeking and getting unanimous advice to open the schools. Now, one of the most common complaints I hear from teachers is hybrid learning. The teacher has to split their attention between the students in class and students on screen. Teachers and students are suffering because teachers can't keep up and can't engage students on both mediums. Will the Minister of Education and his shameful legacy listen to teachers and put an end to Question. hybrid learning? And Minister of Education. 
you know, there's two million children learning in class today. Under the leadership of our Premier, uh, our youth have one of the lowest case rates for COVID-19 in Canada. We have one of the highest vaccine rates in the country for our young people. That's not a coincidence. It's because we put in place a plan with the full support of medical experts across Ontario, including in Toronto, uh, to make sure our kids and staff remain safe. We've increased mental health funding by 400 percent from the former Liberal government. We know that there's more we can do to support uh, the learning experience of children, making sure it is enriched academically, uh, as well as to benefit the physical and mental health of children. We've worked hard through this past year to strengthen ventilation improvements, to make sure every school is safer for kids to return to, which they are today. And as a result of that, two million children are in schools benefiting from that experience. We're going to continue to work with the Chief Medical Officer Health, continue to invest, continue to improve air ventilation, and Response. continue to make quality learning our priority to ensure the learning gaps that have emerged globally to all children around the world are remediated with a Made in Ontario Learning Recovery Plan with $85 million of investment to do just that. Next question, member for London North Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Small businesses have been desperate for any provincial support throughout this pandemic. When this government finally listened to the NDP and provided provincial grants, constituents of mine like Jeannie breathed a sigh of relief. Jeannie has six separate businesses, each with her own HST number, payroll number, and corporate number. But this government apparently does not want to support Jeannie. She only received support for one of her businesses. We hear this government talk over and again about supporting businesses, but when the rubber hits the road, conservatives stall out. But guess what, Speaker? Jeannie's got the receipts. Jeannie made numerous calls and ministry officials promised her each application would be looked at separately and deposits would come through at different times. She's got the receipts. She recorded the conversations. When will this government support business people like Jeannie? Will you honour your ministry's promises and open up the OSBSG to new rounds of grants so all other hardworking Ontarians Question. can get the support that they deserve? The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for, uh, sorry, the Minister, the Member for his question. Um, speaker, our government has made a number of supports available to employers beyond the program as part of our $51 billion action plan in response to COVID-19. The Ontario Small Business Support Grant has delivered nearly $3 billion in urgent and unprecedented support to over 110,000 small businesses right across our great province. Over 110,000 businesses received the first grant, and over 95,000 businesses received both first and second grants. About 14,500 small businesses received the first payment were actually ineligible, but we still let them keep that funding. Speaker, I really want to just reiterate on the businesses that I've met right across this province who are very, very thankful for the support that we've been giving them. Spons. But not only that, to be able to use those funds in any way that they saw fit for their business, whether it was paying wages, whether it was paying for rent or other utilities, we let them use it as they saw fit. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.